Hello and good evening to all of you. Welcome to this evening session of today's meeting, the non-Hermitian physics at ICTS Bangalore. And we are going to start the first day evening session. Yeah, we have the first speaker in this session, Professor Panko Nori from Riken, Tokyo, Japan. And he will be talking on uh, a summary of some of our results on the non Hermitian quantum mechanics and PT symmetry in optics. So with this, I invite Professor Nodi to speak on this topic. Oh, hello, uh, can you hear me? No. Sure. Yes, we can hear you. Sir. Yes. Okay, so therefore, I would like to first thank the organizers for their kind invitation. This is a haiku, it's a three-line poem. And uh, I would like to also provide special thanks to the audience here for attending the afternoon talks. Afternoon talks are known to be difficult on uh, speakers, or actually on the audience, as you can see here. In many afternoon talks, people just take naps. They just fall asleep. And I hope you'll be awake. A Many talks in this meeting are theoretical, some are experimental. So I thought the last minute that it might be perhaps a good idea to expose the many students in the audience to a couple of important photonic experiments on PT symmetry and not to uh, uh, impose on them a huge amount of theory slides already. They already there are quite a lot of theoretical slides already. These are not recent experiments, but according to many people, they have been influential in the field. They have been very highly cited. So I thought that for the students, that would be important to be exposed to this. The results presented here are known to experts, but not known to students. So the, 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 the professors will most likely, they know all of this. They should be known, it should be new to the students. In fact, the experts will likely reach their ground set energy very soon. The first part of the talk, let us consider a very simple problem, couple resonators, very simple, very pedestrian problem. What can you do with them? You can just couple resonate, you can do optical diodes, you can do, you can do lasing, you can do a variety of different things when you couple them. So the light is coming here, the light is evanescent wave coupled here, is moving through this loop here, then it moves through this loop here, and then eventually gets out here. So this is a diode where the light moves in this direction, but the light does not propagate in the opposite direction. So there is a directionality. And this for some applications is important to have optical diodes. Also in the case of lacing, you have two resonators and you add the amount of loss in one of the resonators. And then suddenly this resonator starts lacing, which is counterintuitive. In order to get lacing, you need to increase gain, not loss. But it is possible to obtain lacing by increasing losses instead of gain. And this can be done with very simple resonators coupled with each other. So it's a very, very simple system. We've been doing several works on this. I'll be talking about two of them, optical diode and the, the lacing one. The collaborators are listed here, Peng, Ozdemir, Lei, Monifi, Gianfreda, Long, Fan, Lang Yang, and Professor Carl Bender, who started this entire field a long time ago, also with Rotter, Yisma, Leifter. So there have been quite a few people involved into this, and they are the real heroes of this project here. I'll be making just a summary on photonics here. How do you obtain new structures with new fun functionalities in photonics? One route is photonic crystals. In this case, you take a sample, you drill holes all over, and you get a frequency selector. So these are the frequencies you're selecting. Or a different route is to consider metamaterials. So you get your circuit boards, your split ring resonators, and you can bend light in unusual ways, in different manners. So these are two ways to obtain new structures not existing in nature that gives you new functionalities. Are there any other routes for structure with properties which are not attainable in naturally existing materials? A different route 
is to harness gain and loss. This can be done in photonics. These are the two examples today, but there are cases in acoustics, mechanics, auto mechanics, electronics, but we have been working on many of these fields, but let's, let's take only two examples here. We well, have different knobs. One knob is coupling, the loss, and the gain. So by changing these three knobs, then you can actually obtain new devices, new functions, to do what? Well, you can get a photonic network layer where you can get the on-chip optical routing. So you can actually get the light to go in different directions, optical isolators, optical circulators. So you can get the light whenever you wanna go, coherent, perfect absorbers, PT symmetric lasers, et cetera, et cetera. So there are different possible applications that have been studied this for quite some time already. The starting point as explained uh, in the morning sessions is that you don't focus only on, on uh, closed system, to focus on the open ones. When you get the open ones, you can get situations where you have non Hermitian Hamiltonian, and then if you wish to have real eigenvalues, this can be obtained if this condition is met. Otherwise, you obtain complex eigenvalues. So this is an important condition to satisfy. And these PT symmetric Hamiltonians can have an entirely real eigenvalue spectrum. So therefore we talk about part one, or let's talk about, uh, okay, a bit about exceptional points. So a very simple non emission system is this one here where kappa refers to the coupling and the losses are gamma one and gamma two. You can see here diagonal losses and the total loss is the sum and this capital gamma is the loss difference. So when you change the loss, the losses and the coupling, so you can go over this regime where you can get split frequencies, same damping, or coalesce frequencies at this exceptional point where things are merging, plus or minus, or the real parts coalesce, but the imaginary parts are different damping, plus or minus here. So this is a canonical simple emission system. So you, you change the coupling, you change the loss, and you can cross this this uh, point, you can get the exceptional point. So we talked about this before. So in this case, the parity operator acts like this, time reversal like that. You can put them both in together and then P remains into P, X to minus X and I to minus I. So if you start with a Schrodinger equation, you can change T to minus, uh, here it is, T to minus T, X to minus X, complex conjugate. And then when you do that, you reach the condition it dissatisfied the Schrodinger equation, so does PT, complex conjugate minus XT, as long as you get this condition here. So the VX is equal to VX star minus X. So therefore, since the experiments in this regime are not so easy to make, so the proposal made long time ago is to map the quantum problem into a classical problem. This, is, this refers to the paraxial equation of diffraction is the electric field going through a whispering galler mode. So therefore it's confined through a, a pipe, essentially like a, a tube. And then this, there is a formal analogy or mapping between the quantum problem and the classical one. We're going to be working on the classical regime here. So you forget about this PT potential condition is replaced by a condition on the in this refraction, which was obtained by McCreese and uh, Elganini, Christodolidis, and others in Florida some time ago. So therefore, you can you can change the parameters. You can get is the same transition we were discussing before, where there is the real part of the imagine of the in this refraction, the imaginary part, and there are these real and complex eigenvalues. So you prefer the system in a tunable, specially modulated electric function. You couple them and then you, you need to be able to control the coupling and they use couple more theory to study. So therefore, this is the cartoon. You have the system, you apply P, you exchange the system. And then if you apply T, your, the gain becomes loss, loss becomes gain. So you're mapping one into the other one. And you can apply this consecutively twice or you can do it in one shot. So this is the manga summary or the cartoon summary of something that can be done more precisely by having a, let's say a two level system here. So the coupling is uh, off diagonal 
there is a loss and a loss, but if you change, you make this transformation, you can get here a loss and again Hamiltonian. So the loss is this one here, and the gain is this one here, here. So therefore, you get actually this loss and the gain are flipped here. So therefore, you can actually uh, change the parameters, and then you can see first split frequency, no damping. You get to these coalescing frequencies where there is no damping. There is this so called PT symmetric phase transition where omega plus equal to omega minus, and then eventually the real parts coalesce, and there is one mode amplifying, and the other mode is dissipating. So, therefore, now the goal is to tune this knob or the coupling, the loss and the gain, and see what happens. And, the, and again, we're trying to do this because we would like to see if these non inhibition systems can provide a new route for new structures with different properties that conventional structures. So we go now into PT and EP in optical system and resonators. So therefore the whispering gallery modes were studied in many systems. This one here is St. Paul's Cathedral in London. This is in Turkey and uh, this is St. Louis. So the sound waves are confined along the walls and propagate and refocus throughout using this internal reflection. This was studied by Lord Rayleigh for the first time a long time ago. So therefore, the question is how to do structure with propagate light in the same way. And this is done by using whispering gallery optical resonators. And these come in different shapes and forms. They look like a mushroom or discs or spheres they can be coupled to uh, uh, this uh, fiber optics here. A, the Q factor, the high quality Q factor could be 10 to the eight or 10 to the nine or 10 to the three or 10 to the four. There is all kinds of cues out there. And then the light, it has multiple reflections. Many, these are all intense. These are low optical loss, sharp resonance, high quality factor, long photon lifetime. So therefore the photon can remain here for a long time because there is a low optical loss. But not only this, there is a very small volume. Small volume means your, the light is very confined. This intense resonant light together with the long photon lifetime means what? You get long photon lifetime plus intense light, you get a very strong light matter interaction. This is typically weak. The dipolar coupling is small because the atom di dipolar moments are very tiny. So therefore to enhance light matter coupling is difficult. So you need to have low optical loss and small volume. And this can be obtained by the system here. So now if you focus on this one here, these micro toroids, typical cues are 10 to the eight, sizes 20, 30 microns, powers about milliwatts, photon lifetimes are about 100 nanoseconds, the number of round trips were pretty, pretty many, like 30 meters optical path, 10 to the five loops. So they, they rotate here many, many, many times before they get out. So they're confined at the edge, this is a cross section, this is the top view, and the light is leaking out exponentially, is evanescent mode. The evanescent coupling can be coupled via prism or a waveguide. You can take a fiber optic, you can stretch it. When you stretch it, there is this, this leakage of photons that can get inside the resonator or the fiber. This one here can be obtained by taking the fiber and is stretched with some heat and then it becomes thinner and thinner and then the light can leak out easier. So therefore once it leak out is confined to the edge of the micro mm -hmm. These micro are built following a procedure and then they look like this. And this, is, this can be coupled to a, a, a fiber optics here. And then, but these are the edge microtoroids, which can be put here at the edge right here. And then this allows to put two next to each other. There is here a gap and the gap can be made small or large. And then here there are these, uh, these fiber optics uh, connected to them. So therefore these, there is a gap between them and it's possible to actually move these microtoroids away from each other and close to each other very slowly. So you can actually control the coupling, and this is important. 
you also need to get gain. How do you get gain? You need to have airborne dope microtoroids. Airborne dope uh, fiber optics are used for telecommunications. So therefore there's a pump laser and then there's an output here. So you're actually driving the system and you can get a gain because there's a lacing. This is one. The, the, these materials allowed some output laser power as a function of the input. So therefore you combine the airborne dope ones that provide gain with the other ones, which are the garden variety ones, the usual one that have loss, you can couple them in this way or this other way, or there are many different ways to do it. You have weight guys, you have resonators, and then you can get these PT symmetrical optimus, op optical systems, which are coupled structures that have a balance gain and loss. So these are the so-called PT symmetric optical structure, either way, weight guys or resonators. In this case, these are whispering gallery mode resonators with trap light efficiently with total internal reflection at the edge of this concave convex shape made of typically silica. And when you put them together, they form a photonic molecule. Their individual modes undergo mode splitting, similar to a transition for electronic levels when atoms form molecules. So therefore you can get in this case, the light coming in this direction here and then here, and then gets out here because there is this evanescent wave coupling here and evanescent light coupling here and there, but not in the opposite direction. Because there is optical nonlinearity and then uh, it's amplified one direction, it's attenuated in the opposite direction. So therefore, uh, when you have gain and loss, in this, you can alter the frequencies and the spatial profiles of the optical modes. This is initial version of spontaneous symmetry breaking, where uh, in one regime, the energy is distributed evenly, uh, uh, evenly across both uh, resonators. So in a way that the gain and loss compensate each other, but when there is a PT broken modes, they become spontaneously concentrated in either the amplifying or the lossy half and then undergo either net gain or loss. So they can, the symmetry can be broken. So these are the top view of this object here. They are separated, they see a gap. They're coupled by this light on the left, on top and the bottom. This is the side view and the coupling strength is varied. And then the red curves is what happens when there is lossy. This is standard one. So this is most splitting. So the energy difference is grows with, with the coupling. Larger the coupling, they, they, they split up. But once you put gain a loss, the coupling strength grows and the frequencies remain constant until there's a point where they split in two different branches. Or if you have here, red curves are both of them lossy. So they're both losing energy, but if you have one lossy and one with gain, eventually they both coalesce when, you, when, you, when the coupling is strong enough. So there's a phase transition, a spontaneous PT symmetry breaking, which is not the same as the usual ones, which is good. You wanna have something different, not the same usual stuff. And in the broken symmetry phase, the eigenvalues become complex. So this is a simple derivation here. You get these eigenmodes, and as a function of the parameters, you can get split frequency, no damping, coalesce frequency, and coalescent pairs. One more amplifying, the other one dissipating. And this is from the pioneering paper by Bender Butcher in 1998, where these systems are a subset of these systems here, which are separate from this class of systems studied for a long time. So therefore, when you change gain and loss and the coupling strength is important, you can move the system closer or away to this degenerate point. And again, the key point is to move away from the quantum regime into a regime which can actually be studied classically in easier experiments, at least early on. But this requires some specially modulated refractive index. So if at the beginning, the energy could be equally distributed on the left or the right. And when you go into this branch, the energy concentrates on one direction and here in the opposite direction here, and this, if you're looking at the imaginary part of the eigenvalues, on the real part, there is a coalescence here. So when the coupling strength is weak, they have the same eigenvalues and eventually they split. 
So this is the summary here. So if you can change in the experiment, you can change the Q fact also theoretically. You can do theoretically, experimentally. Theoretically, it's the dashed line, experimentally, the dots here, the symbols. You change the Q factor, you can change the actual location, the bifurcation from one Q factor to another Q factor here, or this one to this one here. And, uh, and you can actually pump the energy in one direction here or the opposite direction here. So what you can do in the usual phase, that is the transmission is linear with the input power. When there is broken symmetry, it saturates. Eventually there is the, the nonlinearity. Uh, it means the following we see here in a moment here. So therefore, when the PT symmetry is broken, the field is localized in the resonator with gain regardless of whether the field is input on the lossy resonator or the resonator with gain. So this field localization effectively enhances nonlinearity. And this can be done at very low powers. I mean, theoretically, people don't care about this, but people are thinking about application. They would like this to happen not at the watt or milliwatt uh, level, but more at the, at the microwatt level, so like much smaller. And then, uh, uh, so this is the reciprocal transmission, the linear regime. The linear regime, if you do unbroken, broken symmetry, there is not much of a difference here. So it's reciprocal. There is no reciprocal transmission in the nonlinear region. You see here that without pump, the signal is zero. But then once you break the symmetry, the peak here is completely gone. So the difference between the red and the blue is that in the red one, the output is red, and in this case here, the output is this blue one here, but there is no, there is no signal here. So essentially the, the system has been, the signal has been obliterated to zero. Essentially there is not even a, a trace of it. This is 20 something, and this is not even visible. So therefore in the linear regime, so there is here the comparison. There's a complete absence of signal one direction, less than two microwatts of power to observe non-reciprocity. So this is very small. The typical laser pointers are between one to five milliwatts. So they are like three orders of magnitude more powerful. So this is, these are very low power signal. There is no applied magnetic field is needed. It's the first non-reciprocal light transmission based on BT symmetric concepts. And this did have an impact for quite some time. And the basic is very simple. You couple resonators, you put gain and loss together. The first demonstration between symmetry and the breaking in resonators in a controllable manner. It allows you to do a reciprocal light transmission and you can enhance the transmission in one direction, not, not the other one. What happens if you have both of them passive, both of them losses? So in that case, you have this one here. They're both losing energy. And then, uh, a, you're reversing the effects of loss by more loss here. So in this case, there is the PT symmetry. So you add here uh, uh, a tip made of chromium that enhances the loss. So therefore the signal here is suppressed, is enhanced here and eventually this lasers. The counterintuitive part is when the nano tip comes here, this eventually is lacing. So you're actually enhancing the losses and you get the lacing, which is counterintuitive. So therefore, the goal here is to experimentally probe the vicinity of this susceptible point. Typically, you need to add two parameters, uh, which will be the coupling strength and the loss. And, and tuning these two parameters allows the system to approach, to approach the susceptible point. And then uh, it's... Uh, so here, the two systems here, there is a gap in between. You can actually change the gap. So that's the coupling. And if you see this arrow here, which is hard to see, this pointing towards a tip made of chromium, which is very tiny here. And this tip is the one that increases the loss. So initially you have a point one here. So this is the real and imaginary part of the frequency. You start at point one, and we increase the losses due to the tip, you move to 0.2 and then 0.3 and then 0.4. Here you can see 0 0.2, 3, 4, and eventually you reach the septional point. Beyond that, one of the resonators is losing energy very fast. The other one gains energy uh, in the opposite direction because it's gaining energy. So therefore the real parts 
of the super modes coalesce the imaginary parts bifurcate. One of the, one of the becomes more lossy, the one is less lossy. The symmetry breaking after the septinal point. This, has to, this can be seen as the following. The one which is lossy loses energy very fast and is dumping energy into the other resonator, allowing it to lace. So the energy is not coming out of the, the blue due to magic, but it was actually, it's actually driven by the resonator losing more energy. You can see here the Raman power versus the wavelength. When you increase the loss, first you're suppressing the, the, the lacing in the, in the signal, and then slowly keeps coming back and you recover completely and even more. This can be said as a function of power, detuning, et cetera. So when the loss is below critical value, Raman lacing is annihilated. When you increase the loss, it pushes the system close to a secular point, localizes the field in the less, in the less lossy resonator. So beyond the susceptible point phase transition, increasing the loss helps to recover the Raman lacing. So therefore, uh, the background already talked about this. This is the first demonstration of septinal point in coupled passive because there is no optical gain. None of the resonators is erbium doped. None of them are pumped. Both of them are lossy. One of them, the loss can be controlled. And then by doing this, they coalesce real parts by 4 And one of the modes become more lossy while the other one less lossy and the symmetry breaking is a final point. When loss is below critical value, Raman lacing is annihilated. And then uh, the significance is that you can reverse the effect of loss by introducing more losses and lacing can be recovered. So therefore here, let me just briefly uh, show you uh, another, uh, 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 here like a, uh, here the other few slides on some of the work we're doing here. Let me just show you briefly here some result we have on, let me just hide this here on, uh, on quantum spin hole effect and light of light and photonic analogs topologically insulated. We've been working been doing for some time. We're still working on this with Konstantin Bliok and the Smirnova, mostly with Bliok actually. It's a very quick overview of quantum hole effect before considering the one for light, for electrons. You had these edge states operating the quantum hole effect, quantum spin hole effect, but the difference in this case, spin up and down are moving opposite direction. In this case, there's spin momentum locking. Therefore, they, there is the ones moving in one direction and the opposite direction, there are opposite spins. In this case, it doesn't have to be the case. So therefore, a, so therefore these are the focus on edge states because these are robust against perturbation disorder defects. So therefore, in this case, the quantum hole effect involves electron unidirectional edge modes. It's called charge momentum locking. The quantum spin hole effect, they have H state with opposite spins propagate in opposite directions. This is called spin momentum locking. And this gives rise to these materials called topological insulators. So therefore for electrons, you have this uh, spin momentum locking. So therefore they spin up and spin down, they move in opposite directions at the edge, it's called spin momentum locking, opposite spin propagate in opposite directions. You can have the 3D version of it. You can do this topological insulator. You can see the mere momentum space in real space, in 2D or 3D and uh, have been studied. So therefore we were wondering how to do this for light, to surface mode with spin momentum locking. And then people were studying photonic topological insulator looking, using complex metamaterials. What we showed is that you can use free space light already possesses intrinsic quantum spin hole effect. And a simple natural material such as metals supporting surface plasma polarity modes can exhibit some features that resemble topological insulators are obviously very different, but the analogies are striking and uh, many people are kind of excited about this, this in the area of topological photonics. We have seen that different experiments done before our work, they could be all understood in terms of spin control in direction excitation of surface modes or wave gag modes. And this, I'll show you this in a moment, some of these examples here. So therefore we have here, the standard propagating plane waves, where there is here this uh, uh, polarization here is written in terms of sigma, which is the helicity. 
and these photons carry intrinsic angular momentum or spin, which is one here. This one here is longitudinal and is helicity dependent spin. So therefore, depending on helicity, plus or minus, you can get uh, different uh, spins, different intrinsic angular momentum. And you can see here, these electric field vectors of a traveling circularly polarized electromagnetic waves. So this is a standard one for bulk materials. What happens on surfaces? On surfaces you have here, you have the metal that is the electromagnetic waves decay exponentially in the vacuum. So therefore the K vector along the vacuum is I times kappa. So it's imaginary because this allows the exponential decay. And we found the prediction that instead of having only longitudinal momentum intrinsic, it is all also transverse. This can be seen because then the electric field in this case is creating a cycloid. And the cycloid creates, has a corresponding angular momentum, which is transverse to the motion of the, the electric field. And this transverse spin occurs in evanescent electromagnetic waves at surfaces. And this becomes important for, for small samples that have a lot of surfaces. So the evanescent modes, they have spin, they have this, this is the evanescent part along the X direction. So this is exponentially decaying. So let me do good if I can do here the, the laser pointer. This is where the exponential decay, I know, sorry, along the X direction, exponential decay, this is propagates along Z and is exponentially localized along X. So in this case, it can be derived that the transverse momentum is helicity independent, which is counterintuitive and is transverse. We began working on this some time ago and uh, initially people thought this was crazy, but the, this can be seen in an intuitive manner by looking at the surface waves in the ocean, in, the, in, a, in a water tank. So as you can see here, let me see if I can get this moving here. There is here animation uh, that shows that the waves are moving, has a large amplitude here. Let me see if I can get this to move out oh, here it is. I think it was working before. Anyhow, so therefore you can see here that this, the actual wave is large near the edge and it becomes smaller once you go further and further down. Used to wait. Yeah. Anyway, so therefore we have been working on this on these uh, external momentum and spin vanessing waves. And then uh, the well-known textbook statements that the momentum of light is determined by the pointing vector. The momentum of light is directed along the wave vector and is independent of polarization. And the spin angular momentum of light is determined by the circular polarization and is directed along the wave vector. So this is Jackson, Landau Lifshitz, Born and Wolf, any book on electromagnetism or optics will tell you these results. These are standard. What we found is that our results challenge these statements. And this is why we had some problems initially to publish it. But right now, there are enough experiments supporting these ideas that the momentum of light in, under some conditions is not determined by the pointing vector. The momentum of light does not have to be directed along the wave vector. And uh, it doesn't have to be independent polarization, can depend polarization. And the spin angular momentum of light is determined by the, it's not always determined by circular polarization and it's not always directed along the wave vector. So we found that there are cases where the samples become smaller and smaller, like in nanophotonics, where surfaces become dominant, where suddenly these effects become not only appear, but they become dominant. And this, this is seen in, in the tiny samples people are studying in nanophotonics. There's several experiments here. Let me give you a, a cartoon of one of them here, done mostly in the UK, the experiment actually done in the UK of a direct measurements of the extraordinary optical momentum at transverse spin dependent force using nano cantilever nature physics. There is also resolved by Capasso, Harvard, where they all find this weak spin force perpendicular. So therefore this unusual transverse spin a, is related to this, uh, this uh, propagation of uh, 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 these Maxwell waves in opposite directions. And this corresponds to the optical analog 
of topological insulators because you replace topological insulator by by the vacuum. So the Dirac cone is given is given by the by the usual Dirac cone of light light in the vacuum. So that's a perfect topological insulator. You replace the insulator by a metal because if you are a photon, the metal is an insulator below the plasma frequency. And the edge states are replaced by the surface plasma polariton that has similar essentially behavior. So there is a condensed matter analogy between this metal vacuum interface and semi-metal and insulator. And this has been seen in different experiments, I'll show you very quickly. And then these uh, surface plasma polaritons exhibit spin momentum locking, which are typical for electrons in quantum spin Hall effect states. So all of them, the experiment, you get light here, you can actually change the helicity, either left or right. And depending on the helicity, you are generating maximum modes in one direction or the opposite direction. So this is called the spin-dependent direction of surface modes. And these are typically coupled to a scatterer or directly impinging on the surface. So these are examples of nanofibers. You can actually change the helicity on the left or the right. You're actually firing photons on the left or the right in a controlled manner by changing the helicity. Like in this case here, with one helicity, you get photos in one direction, the other helicity, you get photos in the opposite direction. This is for photonic wave guides, for nanofibers. And these are for other experiments. These are for surface plasma polaritons. You can actually change the helicity. You can actually generate excitations in one direction or the opposite one. This is an example here. They can realize chiral waveguide copper in which the handness, the the chirality of the incident light determine the propagation direction of the waveguide. You can actually control and manipulate the light in optical waveguides. Also another experiment looking at the local helicity of the modes, you can actually, uh, you can get this left or right words propagating modes with near unity directionality. You can actually control the spin with a photonic pathway and then uh, the transverse spin changes sign when direction of propagation is reversed. So you can actually control the propagation direction. And the direction of propagation of the surface plasma waves, which has is intrinsically has initial transverse spin, determines a scattering direction direction for this spin carrying photons. And then, uh, so therefore, there were several experiments looking at these uh, analogies. And the picture to have in mind will be something like this one here. Replace the topological insulator by vacuum, the insulator by metal, and these are surface plasma polarity modes at the edges. And this is the canonical uh, situation here. So let me just show you now the, the conclusions here. So we have shown that pure free space light already possesses intrinsic quantum spin hole effect. And the simple natural materials such as metals supporting surface plasma polarity modes exhibit features that resemble topological insulator. Of course, are not the same. There are quite a few experiments that can be explained like this. And this is intrinsic because the spin, the spin momentum locking in surface maximum modes extends from the transversality and the spin orbit interaction of light. And then, uh, so thank you for your attention and thank you for the invitation to be here. Okay, thank you, Franco, for a nice illuminating talk. Uh, now we have some time for discussion. Uh, there is a question in the chat box. Let me uh, get it. Charumati, can you uh, unmute and ask this question? Or if you want, you can read the question to me. Yeah, let me read. Without coupling gain and loss in two waveguides, can we find PT symmetry in single waveguide, both gain and loss in a single waveguide? This is the question. Typically, if you want to have gain, you need to do Airbnb dope. You need to be able to drive it. So therefore, if you want, if you need to control the coupling. If you need to control the coupling, you need to have a gain and a loss separate and the coupling together. If you could embed them into a device, I don't recall now, 
where the coupling could be controlled within one waveguide, then it might be possible. I don't see that because typically they're separate, two entities, one of them has gained, one of them has lost. You need to be able to put them close to each other, far away. So I do not see now how to do that, but there might be some, some trick to do it, but I, I think it requires two separate resonators. Yeah. Is there any other questions, comments? No. So let's thank the Professor Franco Nori for his excellent talk. And